Hello, uh, my name is Jason Schwab. I'm a producer at Restaurant Spaces, and this is the very first episode of our web show, Disrupt. We've uh, we even got our name plastered up here on the wall, um, which I might add, this is very real laser precision cardboard, just the best thing for you guys. Um, uh, but you're probably wondering, what even is Disrupt? Um, but look, before I tell you what Disrupt is, I want to tell you why we decided to call this whole thing Disrupt in the first place. Disrupt. Now, that's a word you've probably heard a lot over the last year, I bet. Do you remember what it was like exactly 12 or 13 months ago? I do. It was chaos. It was like every single member of humanity threw up their arms in a collective flailing mess and admitted we have no idea what we're doing. Uh, news articles, blog posts, online commentators and gurus started telling us that we need to disrupt ourselves, disrupt ourselves, disrupt yourself. But the, the truth is, is that the restaurant industry, this is something that you guys have been doing for some time, well before COVID even hit. The way that our relationships are with food are changing. The way we eat is changing. Technology is changing. And if you are someone who designs and or builds stores, you've had to regularly reevaluate what it is you do and exactly how it is that you uh, do that. I've been having a lot of conversations with a lot of you in the industry over the last six months. And my general take is that uh, this idea of dis disrupting yourself or embracing a disruptive mindset is something a lot of you are really, really used to. If that doesn't sound like you, then hopefully this little LinkedIn live show uh, might get you a little further into that headspace, or at least that is what our aim is. Because what is disrupt? Disrupt is an opportunity for you to let go of just a little bit of who you thought you were. Every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern, you can tune in right here and you can expose yourself to some ideas, some way of looking at things that might challenge you to change the way that you think. With Disrupt, I invite you to adopt a mindset of willingly pulling the rug out from underneath yourself, to open yourself up to the notion that just one teeny idea might get you to shift how you see everything. And how are we going to do that? Um, definitely not by just listening to me. I'm just uh, some guy, some guy with pretty wild, ordinary hair right now. Um, the way that we're going to be doing this is every week we're going to be chatting with someone in the restaurant business, someone with big ideas, someone who might be experimenting, someone who might be one or two steps ahead of where we are right now. And we're just going to have a casual conversation with them. We're going to see what they're up to and we're going to learn about what they're thinking about when it comes to the future of chain restaurants. Uh, and our very first guest on Disrupt is someone I'm really excited to introduce you to today. But uh, before we do, it is time for a very shameless 30 second plug because I have told you about what Disrupt is, but uh, what's Restaurant Spaces? Uh, before the world kind of caved in on itself last year, Restaurant Spaces was a live, in person, in the flesh event, a gathering, a retreat for top leaders in restaurant design, development, construction, and technology. We would create a space where they could come together, share ideas and inspiration, and then go away back to their daily grind and figure out the future of restaurants. And uh, obviously, we haven't been able to do that for a while. In fact, the last time that we were able to do that was right on the eve of COVID, way back in early March last year. And uh, I'm really happy to let you know that we are going ahead with our live event, a return to our in-person event in October 17th to the 19th in Palm Springs. Uh, my, my producer, Laura, is waving her hands at me, which means my 30-second plug is over, um, but we are going to be putting uh, that link in the chat there just now. If you want an invite to that event, head to the uh, link there and request one, and hey, maybe we'll be seeing you in Palm Springs come October. But enough of that. Uh, it's time to bring on our guest for today, very first guest. And our uh, first guest on Disrupt is a person called Jeff Alexander. Jeff is the president and CEO of WowBow, which is a concept I'm sure you've heard uh, a lot about over the years. 
Um, and it's really exciting to have uh, Jeff on uh, the show today. The last time, the first time that I met Jeff was actually way back in a time called 2019 uh, when Jeff came and spoke at our live event. And, you know, what really struck me about Jeff is that he really seems like this person who is extremely forward thinking. Um, at the time when he spoke at the event, they had a uh, well, had a, a handful of physical locations and they were running those physical locations on just two staff members, thanks to the use of kiosks and cubbies. And interestingly, at the time, Wow Bao was dabbling in the ghost kitchen space. And um, at the time, it wasn't something that was really working out for them. But fast forward to 2021, and at the end of the year, Wow Bao is aiming to have a thousand locations, not physical locations, but virtual locations, ghost kitchens, host kitchens. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm really excited about it. I hope you are too. And enough of me talking. Let's finally bring on Jeff Alexander. Jeff, 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 welcome to Disrupt. How are you? I'm well, Jason. Thank you for having me and hello to everyone out there. Perfect. No, thanks for joining us. I see, uh, I see you have your, uh, your own sign in the background there. Thanks for bringing that along. And also, thank you for... Um, <laughs> Thank you for making it look much more professional than our cardboard sign. Um, but no, um, thank you for, for being on the show, Jeff. I, I do want to jump straight into it. Um, look, can you, can you kind of outline where WowBow is right now and uh, what you're working on heading into the future? Yes, absolutely. So uh, WowBow was created back in 2003 as a single brick and mortar location, about 384 square feet. And over the coming years, we grew to a handful of brick and mortar stores. We got heavily involved in technology, doing self-ordering kiosks. Back in 2010, we had a mobile app in the app store. We had uh, online ordering. All that sounds very archaic now, but back in 2010, no one was doing these things. In 2017, we opened up our first fully digital uh, store where you were able to order off of an iPad or your phone and get food delivered via an LCD color, uh, cubby with a uh, personalized cubby with animation on it. Fast forward to 2019, as we continue to grow out our, our concept, we had airport locations around the country, sports stadiums around the country, college campuses. We thought, why can't another restaurant sell our product out the back door, third party delivery? We have national distribution, we're growing our footprint. What a way to help restaurants grow top line sales. That was November of 2019. The team got busy, started working on online training materials, getting busy on uh, third party relationships, building out supply chain. And came uh, January of 20, sorry, that was November of 19. In January of 2020, we launched our first location. Started collecting data, building a pipeline of operators in April of 2020, just as COVID hit, we launched really started moving forward with this. And over the following nine months of 2020, we launched 150 locations. As of today, we have over 300 locations that we've launched and we have a moonshot goal of having a thousand locations, a thousand restaurants across the country selling Wow Bow out the back door, third party delivery. Wow, that's uh, that's really quite a, a journey. When that idea came to you, Jeff, about why can't we sell our product in other restaurants? I mean, this was starting to emerge virtual brands that were just available in delivery apps. That was becoming a thing. But an established brand like Wow Bow had been around for a bunch of years. Was that something that was kind of common at that stage? Yeah, it wasn't really common. What we thought about is we thought, look, we have product that is manufactured for us and we can get safety, consistency, keep the flavor profile the same, and we could give our product to other operators. Think about the, the coffee shop, the corner coffee store that doesn't have a third day part. Think of the hotel that has an entire room service staff, but nobody's actually ordering room service because they're dining out. We thought of the ice cream store that four or five months out of the year, everybody was, nobody was eating ice cream because it was too cold. And we thought of the local catering company that puts out a large catering order and then sits dormant. And all of these operators could really use more top line sales as anybody could and grow their profits. And this is what sparked it. It wasn't because of COVID. It was simply how can we help restaurants grow more sales? COVID just accelerated us exponentially, which is why we've seen such great results and why we're on such a track to, to hit this moonshot number. That's, uh, that's really nice to hear. It's not uh, often you hear that, you know, how can we help other people bring up top line sales or how can we help other people do that? That's, that's genuine. 
A hundred percent is genuine. I mean, look, I, I we make money. Are we growing our national footprint? The answer is yes to both of those. But we got into this idea thinking that if we could get a restaurant another hundred thousand top line sales and drop another fifty thousand to the bottom line, people would sign up. We have some operators who have forty or fifty locations who are working with us, and you can exponentially see what that math looks like and how much we're helping them grow. We call this a dark kitchen program, and the reason why we use that terminology as opposed to virtual or ghost is we believe right now and anytime, even pre-COVID, there was part of the business that wasn't being utilized to its full extent. That area of the restaurant was dark. Right now, because of COVID, a lot of the restaurant might be dark. We are trying to turn the lights back on, grow top line sales, get people back to work, help pay the rent and grow people, uh, gr help provide money to help people grow their main business. Great, excellent. And, and uh, I do want to say to people out there who might be tuning in, um, feel free to put in some questions in the chat and we're going to try and get to a few of those uh, later on today. But Jeff, I do want to take it back a bit. Um, I, I, as I mentioned just before, we did have you speak at 2019 at Restaurant Spaces and uh, uh, you, you did talk about uh, ghost kitchens when you were on uh, the main stage. And I, do, I just want to bring that up now, Laura, if we could bring that up, uh, just a little clip from then, that'd be great third-party delivery systems have an algorithm, for those of you who don't know this, and they say that you need to accept the order within eight seconds when the order comes into your restaurant. The average restaurant is 16 seconds, but to be at the best uh, model to get the most business from the algorithm, you need to accept within eight seconds. So what we were having was LA traffic with one employee, the employee being late to work and orders are coming in, no one was accepting the orders, so the algorithm kicked us lower and kicked us lower and lower. So when in the beginning, when we were at the top of the, your Uber Eats app, when you opened up, we're now like on page four and nobody scrolls to page four when you don't have a storefront in the city when no one knows who you are. Who is right, that so Jeff beard wearing a suit? Who is that guy? <laughs> I, I I don't know. That's, that, was a, that was a younger version of, uh, of oh no, that's, you're talking about Ron Ruggles? Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I was gonna say this is the better. This is the better looking version of me right here. We'll we'll stick. All with right. This. Well, if you, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna comment on that. That's not my job, Jeff. Um, but uh, let's, from, from that point then in 2019 to where you are now, what what's what's significantly different about yeah. what was happening then to to now? Because you know, there's probably still a lot of operators out there trying to figure out if the ghost kitchen game is for them, and they might be in that kind of mindset you had back in, in 2019. Sure. Well, first off, I'll give the shameless plug for your restaurant space as your in-person uh, event because I had a great time at that and it's great collaboration. So I encourage people to attend. Uh, Thank you, Jeff. The clip that you showed, just to give a point of reference, it was referencing a ghost kitchen that we opened back in 2017. In 2017, ghost kitchens were not a very big thing. And we opened up in the LA market uh, for less than $30,000. We're a Chicago-based company. We were able to enter one of the busiest markets in the country for under 30K. The problem with it was we only had one employee at the time. And the reason why is LA labor laws, you can't have a salary manager work an hourly position. So we had an hourly person by themselves. And unfortunately, it wasn't, they weren't able to support the business, whether they had another job or they were running late or they didn't, whatever they did, that sort of what didn't make that work for us. What that did for us though in 2017 is inside Cloud Kitchen, there was another operator. This guy had a pizza business inside 200 square, feet, 200 square feet and he ran four pizza concepts out of his 200 square foot kitchen. He would have, I think it was like 32 tablets. He basically made four different kinds of dough but it was the same sauce, the same pepperoni, the same sausage, peppers and so on. And it was so genius to me that in 200 square feet, you could run four businesses, growing your sales exponentially because of that. It always stuck in our mind. And when we had this idea in 2019 to allow people to take on Wow Bow as a second concept out of their own kitchen, it was really predicated on what we learned watching this other operator back in 2017. And that's why we see such success. And in the virtual space right now, people have the opportunity to run not only their own brand and not only a Wow Bow brand, there are virtual chicken concepts and burger concepts and pizza concepts and the, the gamut goes on forever. And you can have mm -hmm. now in your same uh, uh, location for the same rent you're paying, for the same labor you're paying, you can now run three, four, five, six businesses, increasing your sales to levels you've never seen before. 
Yeah, it's it's really it just sounds like when you when you say that it's kind of just a, we're entering into the strange unknown world. And uh, I mean, well, break break it down in terms of uh, logistically for a a partner brand that wants to have Wowbow coming out of the kitchen um, specifically. What what does that look like? How do they get set up? And and how quickly is that process? Yeah, thank you. So for us, we can get any operator launched in less than five weeks. You know, we tell people five to six. We've gotten in fast as three weeks. The product is all distributed through Dot Foods to any broadliner that the operator works with. Cisco, US Foods, Gordon Food Service, whoever whoever you work with, we can get product to you. We take care of setting up all the third party operators because we have the relationships, the assets, the photos, and so on. What the operator needs to do, the operator needs to boil water. It's as simple as that. Boiling water not only is easy to do, it doesn't require a hood, which means you don't need to put us on your main line. You can put us, our equipment, anywhere you need to put it. Mm -hmm. $60 you need to purchase a rice cooker for 220 bucks. So for under $300, you could be doing wow bell. Our goal is for every operator operator to do at least $2,000 a week in sales by week six. We have stores that are coming out at five, six K right out of the gate stores hitting $10,000 a week. We have two in Michigan that are doing those kind of numbers. So the sales are there. The opportunity is there. And what we offer is we offer a nationally recognized brand with a story doing Chinese food, which has a low competitive set. So we check all the boxes of ease, no labor, no waste, no prep work, recognize name, recognize brand. That's the benefit of working with WowBow. As far as working with virtual brands on any, on any level, as I said before, you can now take what's your existing space and labor and grow your sales by doing something that you haven't done before. Yeah, right. And, and I mean, I want to talk about that because, you know, you, wow, our concept is very specific. And like you say, they just got to boil some water and the product is there. I, I, I mean, how, how much of a key pathway do you think this might be for brands moving forward? Obviously, um, it, this isn't applicable to every kind of uh, concept that you might be able to move in. It, it's not as easy. Do, do you think this is really going to be something widespread and something that a lot of brands are going to want to jump on in order to thrive in the in the next uh, era ahead well look I, I think the dining scene has changed right uh, dur during covid there are states that have been locked down from the beginning there are states that have been open since the beginning the states that are still locked down here in chicago we're still running at 50 percent capacity for dining rooms we have been forced to turn on delivery across the country over the last x amount of months delivery is now becoming part of the everyday diners experience the convenience of having whatever you want sent delivered to you is not going to go away. The fact that DoorDash is valued at 200 something billion dollars and Uber Eats continues to grow market share every day. These companies are going to find ways to continue to grow delivery. I love brick and mortar. I hope brick and mortar never goes away. I don't think it ever will go away. People celebrate it with food and people commiserate with food. Any life changing moment, of happiness or sad revolves around food. If something terrible happens, people bring food to the person. Someone wants to celebrate something, they go and have food with it. Food is always gonna be part of what we're doing and brick and mortar is here to stay. However, the dining habits of the consumer is what's changing. Right now, you have more people living in suburbia than in central business districts because the offices are closed. Those restaurants have never seen so much business because they're not used to having people at home during the day. Delivery is picked up to bring the food to them. When people come back to the office, are they going to go outside and eat? Or are they going to stay at their desk and order whatever they want because they have the ability to get whatever they want whenever they want? I believe that delivery business is going to continue to thrive and grow. And the need of the restaurateur is going to grow. And how do I get more market share in delivery? For instance, mm -hmm. pick any cuisine you want USA. I'm just going to say hamburgers. I love hamburgers probably more than most people. I can't eat a hamburger every day. So if I'm selling hamburgers and I can get you to eat it six days a week, what happens on day seven? If I have a virtual restaurant, I can save that sale on day seven as opposed to losing it to a competitor. Yeah. It, again, it's it just everything's rapidly changing so much. And obviously that trajectory of, de of de delivery and people using apps is just going to continue. And I mean... If I could take it back to the, the, I guess, the built environment in terms of building out a portfolio, you've got a handful of physical locations right now. Are, are you using this as a tool 
where you're seeing uh, large amounts of numbers or good numbers coming in through your host partner companies uh, where you might say, this is a good location for a brick and mortar location? You know, uh, we are not at the moment focused on brick and mortar. I mean, are we able to get data and understand about the consumer and see what's going on the market share? Absolutely we are. But right now, our goal is to get to a thousand units by the end of the year. If I just want to open one more restaurant, just find one restaurant, just to find the lease, sign the lease, build the restaurant, hire the staff. I mean, you're looking at 12, 18 months to open a restaurant. The next 12, 18 months, we could have 1,500 more of these dark kitchens. A, helping other operators and B, growing our national footprint. So are we looking at doing brick and mortar? Not at this time. We are focused on continuing to grow our airport pipeline, our college campus pipeline, our sports stadiums. All of these are low capital expenditure to us and they're all run by somebody else. And we believe that's a great way to grow fast and help other people. The focus right now is to continue to grow the ghost kitchen model and have more operators sign on. Yeah, it's a really interesting and unique uh, model the way that you're doing this. Uh, you know, I guess if we could draw back a bit and look at the ghost kitchen landscape in general. There's a lot of concepts out there, a lot of brands that are umming and ahhing about whether this is a viable option, whether it's for them and it, it isn't for everybody or maybe they should jump into it so they're not a late adopter and they miss the boat. I mean, what's your take on the ghost kitchen landscape as a whole right now as it exists, maybe outside of your model? Yeah, I, look, I, I think it's here to stay. I heard a report that by 2030, the, the virtual restaurant business is going to be like a, a $1 trillion business. Let's just say the experts are wrong. Let's say they're incredibly wrong. Let's say they're wrong by 50%, which is an incredible miss. That's a $500 billion business. I absolutely think the delivery business via virtual is going to continue to grow. Look, somebody said to me on my team recently, eight years ago, you can walk outside and flag a taxi. And five years ago, you could walk down the block and go to a book came along. Amazon came along. I don't think brick and mortar is going to disappear. But do I think that the third party delivery ability and convenience of technology is going to continue to grow this space? 100% do I believe that's going to happen. And these concepts that are out there, when you have celebrities getting involved and people creating food, there's an, there's an attachment to this. The convenience factor that the, that the world is seeing right now, not just in food, but in anything we're doing, it, it, it is changing the way that, 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 that people interact. I mean, you can sit in your house, you can order lunch, you can order your groceries, you can order anything that you, uh, that you want off of Amazon, you can order your movies. <laughs> I mean, everything is made easier for you now. So you have to think, if you look out X amount of years, whether it's two years, five years, 10 years, the restaurant industry has to evolve with it. And right now, we were forced to evolve. I know you used the word disruption. I know it's the name of your show. I look at it as innovation. Disruption causes friction and chaos. We as restaurateurs have to take that disruption and innovate and evolve it and make it so it doesn't hurt our business and doesn't hurt our clients. And our customers want convenience right now. And not only do they want it now, the, the demographic that's following the next wave of, of, of customer base, right? Only no convenience. This is going to continue to grow at, an, at, at a rate that we will not be able to keep up with. Yeah, you, yeah. It's, it, it, these changes are absolutely inevitable, and you're right. Restaurant tools have just got to get ahead of it. Um, Jeff, I, I, I just want to um, cut. We have an audience question come in here, a question from uh, Richard Young from the Food Service Technology Center. I just want to throw this one at you. And uh, Richard asks, do you have a standard equipment package for your product? Are you using any one type of steamer or rapid cook oven? Of course, uh, Richard Young's all in the in the business of uh, cutting down uh, costs and, and electricity and, and just um, being more sustainable in our restaurants. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a good one. We do not require any specific piece of equipment. You need to be able to boil water, which creates steam. If you have an open flame on a stovetop oven, we have a 60, that's $60 kettle that you can get. And that is all you need. You need to buy a rice cooker because you got to make rice for our rice bowls. But as far as a steamer goes, you can have a commercial steamer. You can use induction burners. You can use steamer baskets. We are pretty easy to, to work with the operator. 
Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it sounds definitely like a e- easy and accessible uh, option for for restaurants to get into there. And yeah. um, look, let, sorry. Yeah. Let me just add to that. What we provide yeah. is a product that all you need to do is is steam it. When you get into these virtual concepts that are trying to grow, and I'm not knocking them in any way because the more the more options that are out there, the better it is for the consumer. But we don't require prep work. We don't require you to bring in hamburger and make patties or you know cut onions and scallions and tomatoes and buy buns and condiments. We don't have any of that work that's involved with our product. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but as you're turning on a virtual brand, you need to think about the work labor that you're adding to this. Also, as an 18-year-old brand, we know our packaging works to keep the food hot and travels well with the third parties. If you're out there thinking about starting a thir- uh, uh, your own virtual brand, don't forget about the packaging. It's important for the end user. We also have all of our food photography. So when we go on the third party apps, we have great looking food. If you want to start your own virtual tomorrow, don't forget that you got to create the photography for it and have that done. We also have a story. You can Yelp us, Google, Google us, social us. You can find us and learn about us. You start a brand tomorrow, but we just started Jeff's hot dog stand tomorrow. Will people buy from Jeff's hot dog stand? I don't know if they will. Maybe they will. And some people are having luck with that on a virtual scale. Others, you know, there are people like Wow Bao and there are other brands out there that are available for people to turn on. Yeah, it's uh, if, funny you mentioned about putting in the due uh, diligence there with creating a virtual brand. When you scroll through some of the virtual brands that come through on delivery apps, the name, you got to do due diligence on the name. I, there's some yeah. really wild names out there uh, that kind of make me laugh. Um, which I won't say here. Uh, but look, Jeff, I, I do, we are nearly out of time. These are just really short, snackable conversations on Disrupt. Um, but I do want to hit you with one last segment that we have before you go. Uh, and that segment is the bouncer. And I'm just going to explain just for a few seconds what the bouncer is. Uh, a bouncer is a term used in the game of cricket. Uh, for those of you who don't know what cricket is, it's basically like the English Commonwealth version of baseball but way more boring and can be played over five days a bouncer is very similar to a curveball it's something unexpected it's different it catches catches the the batsman off surprise and in cricket when a bouncer is delivered it hits the ground flies up at 160 kilometers an hour towards the batsman's head and uh i'm losing you but that's you get the general metaphorical idea so jeff are you ready for a, a bouncer question I don't think I have a choice of this one, but go ahead. At 160 kilometers an hour, hit me. Here it is. Uh, Jeff, I was uh, stalking your uh, social media earlier, and I found your Twitter, and I found uh, this on, on your, uh, your page. Uh, you, you know, restaurant op- entrepreneur and also uh, spin instructor? Are you, are you a spin instructor, Jeff? Wow, that is like the easiest bouncer you could have thrown my way. Yeah, I've been – I actually – I do – I. I've been teaching spin for about seven or eight years uh, as a side thing. You know, I love, I love, uh, I love spinning. And what happened was, I was at a class at the local gym one day, and the instructor, the instructor never showed up. And we all sort of looked at each other, and no one knew what to do in class. So I just got up there on the bike and started yelling at people. And at the end of class, people applauded. So I thought, hey, I should go do this and get paid. And so I do it once or twice a week. All right. Very cool. Well, um, you know, if you want to hit up Jeff at a spin class, I guess they can find you in in, uh, Chicago somewhere. But Jeff, that wasn't actually, that was a fake bouncer question just to keep you on your toes. (laughs) Of course. It's too easy. No, no, no. no, I've got a real bouncer question for you, Jeff. And, and, And that is, you know, obviously you're this huge proponent of virtual brands. We've just been talking about it the last 20 minutes or so. And obviously, like, like you've mentioned, everything that's happening digitally right now in restaurants is just going to keep catapulting. Um, but look, I, it gets me thinking, you know, what's happening in the, in the food space and in the world in general, uh, what's happening to our connection with food, keeping in mind that everybody is watching right now is generally someone who builds and designs physical spaces so that people can come and have an experience in those places. Um, like everybody else, I've, my usage of delivery apps has really increased. Takeout bags are still piling up in my kitchen and I'm cooking less. And I just want to know, you know, your thoughts on our connection to food. Do you really think that, you probably don't really think, but I mean, do you think that procuring our food by leaving thumbprints on a screen is, is an optimal way of living? I mean, how, what kind of effect do you think this is going to have on us longer term? Look, I, I said it earlier in this, I love brick and mortar. 
And I don't believe brick and mortar is going to in any way, you know, fall off and face the earth. We need to dine out. We are the human species needs to be around other people. We cannot not be around. We need gathering places. And when you gather, you need comfort and comfort is done by food. And as I said earlier, every celebration and every loss is comforted by food or enhanced by food. The celebrations enhanced, obviously. I, I, so I think the immediacy of people who are building restaurants, you need to be thinking about how to do more output for delivery and for pickup. Think about, you know, Sweet Green does the great shelves for pickup. Chipotle is doing pickup shelving. You need to think about whether it's a second line in your restaurant that's dedicated for to go and delivery and convenience so the guests can run into your establishment, grab food and get out. You definitely need to think about that. I also think that due to what we're seeing right now with the labor shortages that's going on in the restaurant industry, restaurants are able to still need to open, but we have fewer bodies who are working. I don't know if the, the, the busboy position as an example is gonna you know, survive. We might have to lose that position. Now, if you're gonna lose the busboy position because you don't have enough employees, Restaurant designers need to think about the bus station. What do the what are the tools of the trade that the server needs? Water, re table resets, you know, things to wipe down the tables. They have to be stationed easily to get to X amount of tables. No server should be like four or five tables distance to their main section or whatever it may be, so they get what they need. And I do think that in 12, 14, 18 months, we're gonna be right back to where we were pre-pandemic. The restaurants will be busier, the bus boys will come back. But if you can plan right now on shrinking the need, shrinking the back of the house without making the front of the house feel empty, right? Throw up curtains, section off areas of your dining room so that you have private party space or be able to hide part of your dining room so the restaurants feel intimate. As people come back to dining, they want to feel safe, they want to feel welcome, and you want a sense of intimacy. And if the restaurant is large and nobody's in it, you are not going to feel intimate. In fact, you're not going to feel safe. You're going to wonder why you're there. So we really have to find ways to make it feel uh, uh, welcoming. Needs to be the focus, I think, right now. That's a Absolutely. whole lot of different directions and uh, different snippets for your answer. Remember, no, that was a call. I didn't prep for that one, so I, I, I winged that one. Well, no, exactly right. Uh, thank you for playing ball with me on that, uh, Jeff. Mind the pun. Um, it's <laughs> you can add you can add master batsman to your uh, list of restaurant entrepreneur, spin instructor. Uh, that's that's the new one on there. But uh, look, Jeff, we we are out of time. Uh, look, I really want to thank you. Uh, always great to hear your wisdom, and I know uh, people listening in, tuning in, will get a lot out of that as well. So um, thank you for being our very first guest on Disrupt. My pleasure. Thank you. Lots of luck, and everyone stay safe. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much. And uh, to everybody else, thank you for tuning in. That is our very first episode of Disrupt. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed listening to uh, those nuggets of wisdom from uh, Jeff just now. And one last thing before you go, uh, we are doing this every week and I just want to give a quick tease to our next episode, next Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern. We are going to be speaking with uh, Melissa Ng from Carver. Melissa is the SVP of design and construction at Carver, another great brand doing really cool, wonderful things and expanding like crazy as well. So really looking forward to that chat with Melissa next week. And just one last other, last, last thing before you guys go. If you like to disrupt, we'd love you to help us out. Uh, you might be able to see somewhere up here in the left-hand corner of the feed. There's a number that's up there. It's probably low. I haven't even looked at it myself because I'm just assuming it's really abysmally low on our first episode. If you like this, you like what we're trying to do at Disrupt and you want to hear from big thinkers in the restaurant industry, share it with your mates. If there's a colleague you think will get something out of this, please share it with them as well and maybe this number will rise astronomically and I can cry tears of joy. Um, but look, thank you for joining us here at Disrupt Episode 1 and we are going to see you next week, hopefully. I'ma need you to back up. I'ma need you to back up. Yep. I'ma need you to back up. Spilling the tea. You stirring the.